Let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, and awesome, and a gracious God. And I pray, as always, that this message is a message that you, God, have for your people. I pray that the proud amongst us would be humbled, but that the humble would be lifted up. In the blessed name of Jesus, amen. What we're doing is going through the book of 1 John verse by verse, and where we are in our journey is 1 John chapter 2. So please open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. We're only going to do two verses. I know, and I'm actually going to put up the two verses here on the screen in, in a second. So I also know that it would be quite easy if we just didn't open up our Bibles and I just put it up on the screen. But I really do believe that it's a healthy thing. It's a right thing. It's a good thing to have us open up our Bibles to encounter the text with our own eyes, uh, holding the Holy Scripture together. So please open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through Two, that we're only going to do those two verses today. My goal, I'm going to tell you what the goal is. At the top of sermons, I write goal. And what I'm hoping happens with the hearer, the people that are hearing the message either in person or online, I have a goal. And my goal today is not an action that you take. It's really an appreciation that we can take a step back, and just stand in awe at how much God loves you and what God has gone through in order to make you and me right with him. Sometimes we as a church or the church body, in an attempt to be relevant, forget some of the most important truths that the Bible has to say. So this morning, we're going to talk about the sin the central message of all of Holy Scripture. And I, my hope is that you leave this place knowing and really experiencing how much you're loved by God. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, just those two verses. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's stop right there. Just that. Just that. Again, I told you I was going to do this. Those two verses in entirety. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's this one word that is the crux of these two verses. And it's a $3 word, isn't it? It's a $3 seminary word. He is the propitiation for our sins. That's a big $3 word. So let's start right there. The word propitiation simply means the means by which someone else is appeased. That's a very difficult definition, but let's pretend. Let's pretend that Scott, Scott Wells, I'll pick on Scott, owes a million dollars to the federal government. We can believe that, right? Scott's been doing something, and he owes the federal government a million dollars. He's been claiming that he's been fixing pumps, and he's been breaking them the whole time just so he can look good. Anyways, <laughs> so he owes a million dollars to the federal government. So a propitiation would be we all gather together out of our love for Scott, and in order to appease the wrath of the federal government, we all gather together a million dollars, and we pay... Scott's fine on his behalf so that the wrath of the federal government is appeased and there's no punishment left for Scott because we made a propitiation. The propitiation is the money. It's the means by which something is satisfied. So I'm going to Chris this translation. What I mean by Chris in it is I'm going to make it so that Chris understands exactly what we're talking about and the hopes that if I Chris it, we're all going to understand it. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the means by which the Father's wrath is appeased due to our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 
Those many words in the parenthetical statement is what propitiation means. So Jesus is the means by which the Father's wrath is appeased due to our sin. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It makes the text more understandable, does it not? So what I want to do is talk about why and how Jesus is the conduit to appeasing God's wrath. But in order to do that, we have to start out at the very beginning. And when I say the very beginning, that's exactly what I mean. We have to start out at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And then God said, let there be light and finish it. Come on, and there was light. That's day one. Day two, God separated the water above from the water below. He created atmosphere on the earth. Day three, he called forth dry land from the waters and created vegetation on the earth. Day four, he created the sun, the moon, the stars, and the cosmos, all of the earthly heavens in all their glory. Day five, he created the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Day six, he created the beasts of the field and everything that would move around on the ground. And then at the end of that day, he capped off his creation with humanity. He made the man out of the dust of the earth. He breathed into the man and the woman. He created the woman out of the rib of the man. And he breathed into them the breath of life, and they became living people. Male and female, he created them. In the image of God, he created them. Those are the six days of creation. And then after those six days, God made a declaration about his creation. What did God declare about his creation? You forgot one little... It was very good. God saw what he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. I want to make this picture real, real clear. The whole creation was perfect. There was perfect peace between humanity and God. Perfect fellowship. God himself, the creator of the heavens and the earth, walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. They were in perfect fellowship. Peaceful, united relationship. And also, humanity was in perfect symbiosis with the creation itself. There was no death at all. No natural disaster. No cruelty or hate. No mourning or pain. Creation was absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. Perfect fellowship. Perfect unity. You didn't even eat meat in the beginning of creation. You only ate the fruit of the trees. Now, I have it on good authority. I talked to the Lord about this. and What he told me was that the fruit in perfection tastes just like steak. So you don't have anything to worry about, okay? Tastes just like steak, all right? So apples tasted just like steak. But nevertheless, that, that's extra biblical. That's the book of second opinions that I wrote. And nevertheless, <laughs> so here we go. All right. Uh, so everything was perfect. There was zero death. Everything was in perfect symbiosis. But because God wanted a real relationship of love with people, he gave them a will. And in order to have a will that it can be exercised, there has to be choice. And so he gave in the center of the Garden of Eden, in the center of paradise, no, no pain or mourning, but in the center of that garden, he created the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then he gave Adam a warning in Genesis chapter 2 about that tree. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. What was there none of in paradise, in Eden? Death, pain, anything. It was perfect. Perfect, holy, and good. But God said that if you do this, you will surely die. So they could intellectually understand it, but they probably couldn't really understand the impact because... They didn't even see what? Anything die or death. Have you ever noticed you can tell somebody a thing, but they don't really understand a lot of times until they experience it themselves? So God said, you will surely die if you do this. Well, you probably know the rest of the story. In Genesis chapter 3, they are tempted by the serpent. Eve eats of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, gives it to Adam, who was with her the entire time he eats. And then what happens? Their eyes were opened, 
And the first thing they do is they see that they're naked, meaning they immediately feel this thing called shame. There was no shame before. They immediately see that things have changed. Sin has now entered the world. They feel shame. And the first thing that they do is they attempt a fig leaf solution to this problem. They tie fig leaves together in order to cover their shame. If that were me, that would be a fig tree. That would not be a fig leaf solution. I'd have to be a lot of covering. But anyway, fig leaf solutions are silly solutions. In order to cover what I did in my disobedience, I do a fig leaf solution. Okay. <clears throat> but they knew that things were different. The process of death, of death began at that time, and the perfect unity and fellowship with God had been destroyed. Not because they ate a fruit, but because they disobeyed God. What this ought to tell us is that through one act of disobedience, one act of disobedience, death came to this entire realm. Now, because of disobedience to God, everything dies. Cancer, cruelty, war, famine, hate, lust, rape, racism, whatever. All sin is in this world because of that one act of disobedience, and it causes death to all people. Because all people sin, therefore all people what? Die. That's what happened. It's that catastrophic you disfellowship from a perfect God and it ends in death. And it also ended in the fact that creation was no longer in perfect symbiosis with humanity either. So, the first, th the first thing that we need to know in order to really understand our faith is sin is serious. This is why it's so serious when the culture at large tells us that sin or certain sins aren't that big of a deal. We're not allowed to say that as Christians. Because according to the Bible, how many acts of disobedience cause death? Just one. You can't tell me that God does not take sin seriously. God takes sin. He hates it. Sin is antithetical to him. He despises it. The wrath of God is poured out on humanity because of this thing called sin. Every war, all famine, all disease, natural disaster, everything is because of sin. The whole creation is in turmoil because of sin. So point number one, sin is serious. God takes it serious. And what is the result of sin? What is the wage of sin? Yeah. Death. So if you notice the very first thing that God did, they tried a fig, fig leaf solution for their shame, and that was not good enough. What did Adam and Eve deserve? So God, at the very beginning, said in order to cover your shame, something else must die. So I want you to imagine a scenario. God, after he curses Adam and Eve, does something. And what he does is uh, pretty amazing. He does it by his own hands. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. The Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. They tried to clothe themselves with what? If you have skins, where do skins come from? So I want you to imagine a scenario. God has now cursed Adam and Eve. Adam is here. Eve is here. They've got their stupid fig leaf solutions. They can't cover their shame. The bugs are already eating the leaves. They're already blowing off. The leaves are already dying. So a permanent solution has to be made for them. So God takes an animal, an innocent animal, that Adam named. Five minutes ago or whatever, they were in fellowship. <clears throat> God slaughters that animal right in front of them. What have they never seen before? They've never seen blood. They've never seen death. They've never heard the cry of pain. They've never seen the life go out of something. So God, by his own hand, slaughters something right in front of them. They see the entrails. They see the death. They see the pain. They see the cruelty. Don't you think that would be shocking? And then God rips the skin off the animal. So the dead decaying animal is right in front of them. And he formulates skins. And he says, the only way to cover your shame is something else, what? Must die. And he covers them. The Lord God himself slaughters that animal and tells them, 
This is how you're going to cover your shame. That's what sin demands. So then God spends the next few millennia beating into the skulls of mush of humanity that because of sin, something must die to pay your penalty. He calls out Abraham out of paganism and he says, I'm going to start a nation with you. And he makes Abraham a promise. You are going to have a son with your wife in your old age. It will be the son of promise. Sarah will have a son. So Abraham and Sarah do eventually have a son. Abraham is 100 years old. Sarah is 90. And they have their son, Isaac. And then Isaac grows. And in Genesis 22, God asks Abraham to do something that he never asked anybody before or since. He tests Abraham by saying these words to Abraham. Abraham, he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. He tells them to walk up the mountain and there kill your boy. So Abraham leaves early in the morning. He does not tell Sarah. I bet he didn't tell Sarah. Yeah, he does not tell Sarah what's up. And he goes. And he doesn't tell Isaac either. Abraham is well over 100 years old. Can you, ama can you imagine this struggle? Your te teenage son, you wrestle while he screams. And you tie him to a stone. You unsheath a knife. And you lift it up and you begin to swing it to kill your own boy. And then it, right when he was swinging down, an angel stops him and says, no. Right in there. And in a thicket is a ram. That ram will take your son's place. And so the ram is slaughtered. Isaac is spared. Once again, what God is showcasing is you deserve to die. But something innocent will take your place and appease my wrath so that you can receive my love. Then God set about an intricate system of sacrifice. It began with the tabernacle, but of course it culminated in Solomon's temple. This is an artist's rendition of Solomon's temple. What is that place where all that smoke is coming up in front of Solomon's temple. It was a place of prayer. The priests would go in. They would pray on behalf of the people. And what it showcased, of course, is that we need a go-between between God and men. But it also showcased there where the smoke is coming off. What was happening there? They were burning sacrifice. I can't imagine being the priest in charge of the sacrifice. There is hundreds of thousands of Israelites... 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it is your job as they bring animal after animal after animal. And it is your job to slice it open, to cut its neck, to steal its life away from it, to throw down the pieces of meat. The, the whole thing would be covered in blood, would be covered in death. And before you slaughtered the animal, you would put your hand on the animal, and that would symbolize transference. Your sin onto this innocent thing, and then that innocent thing is slaughtered and killed. And God tried to beat this into the head of people for millennia. That this is what must take place. Because, what was point number one? Because sin is what? It's serious business. So in order for it to be taken care of, there must be blood. Hebrews 9.22. Under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, finish that with me. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So this all leads up to 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And I'll put up the Chris translation. My little children, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. He doesn't want us to sin. Sin is never good. So he's writing this. I don't want you to sin. Why? Why doesn't he want you to sin? Because sin is what? Because it's serious. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. We have a high priest. We have someone that will go to God on behalf. Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation. Jesus is the means by which Father's wrath is appeased because of our sin. And he did it not just for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world wide world. He did it for the sins of the whole world. Beloved, God hates our sin. He disfellowshipped Adam and Eve because of sin. He disfellowshipped the world because of sin. 
You can't escape it. A lot of times we'll say this, I just don't understand why this, and whatever the this is, is something that the Bible condemns. I don't understand why this is such a big deal. I don't care what you understand. Understanding is not a prerequisite for faith. Whether you understand or not is inconsequential. God is right, you are wrong. So am I. So if God says A is bad, then what? Whether it makes sense to you or not, I don't care. I literally don't. If God says A is bad, A is bad. Remember, we're the ones with sin. No wonder we think A is okay. Because we are the, we're the sinners. So if God says A is bad, A is really bad, he condemned the whole world to damnation because of one act of disobedience. So if A is bad, A is bad. Period. End of story. A, bad. So what he did was he said, listen, I'm going to show you how serious sin is. Death, destruction, cancer, cruelty, hate, rape, murder. You're going to see just how bad sin what? Really is. This is how bad it is. He set up an entire system in order to showcase to to humanity how serious it is. And then 2,000 years ago, it culminated with this. If you can look at that picture and not see how serious sin is, you aren't Christian, man. Come on, people. This is how serious sin is. He had his own boy beat, whipped, spat on The flesh ripped off of his back. You thought slaughtering an animal right in front of Adam and Eve was bad. My goodness, he had his only begotten son slaughtered. That's how serious sin is. But do you want to know what God is more serious about than sin? Forgiving you. Only God in his wrath thinks on mercy. The whole thing was set up just to forgive you. The whole thing was set up just to love you. The whole thing was done just to show you mercy. From the very beginning, when they sinned at first, you know who God didn't save? He didn't save the angels. The angels that sinned, they are doomed to destruction. You know who he did save? You. He saved you. He set up the whole system just to save you. Just to show mercy on you and to show mercy on me. We can't understand Christianity unless we understand these two things. He hates sin. Sin deserves death. But he satisfied himself. What an amazing God. What an amazing God. That's how much he loves you. Abraham was giving up his own son, but then his own son was delivered so that his own son didn't have to be given up. God's son hung on that cross and screamed out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And what did God the Father answer him? Nothing. God the Father let him die. That's how serious it is. And it was paid. Sin is no laughing matter, which is why when this culture takes things that God hates and promotes them as good, celebrates them, pretends that it's altogether regular, you cannot agree. We can't. Because sin is what? And God, the Father, killed his own boy to pay the penalty for it. Do do any of us dare look at a dying Jesus and go, I think you're wrong about that sin. This is a little much. No, we can't. This is precisely what God did. But God is more serious about your forgiveness, which is why that was completed. Beloved, he loves you. He loves you so much. He loves you so much. So what's the lesson? The lesson is, understand your sin. Stop making excuses for it. 
I know it's tough. I know it's hard. And I know why we want to make excuses because it's so stinking hard. I know that. Trust me, I know it. Chris has to battle Chris every day of his life. But instead of making excuses, let's just admit it. God, you're right. I'm not. You are right. And then receive what happened there. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are pure. You are cleansed. You are forgiven. You are accepted by God. And you might say to me, but you don't know what I've done. God knows what you've done, and that's what he did to pay for what you've done. That's it. Can it get any worse? So if he's already taken it, you don't have to take it. He forgives you. He cleanses you. He purifies you. You, according to God, through his son Jesus, are pure. I did something for VBS that I wanted to do with you guys. I love this little experiment. My wife showed it to me. I hope I do it right. Bending is hard for me nowadays. All right, I'm back up. All right. Uh, if I mess this up and I mess up the altar, the ladies are just going to have to forgive me and just remember that Jesus died for us. Amen? All right. So what I want to do... All right. Is this a little experiment? I think it's a neat little experiment. Okay. So what we've got here, is this clean water or dirty water? This is sin, all right? So this is sin, dirt, grime, terrible, it's bad. Sin, no good. This is you prior to sin. What, what do you look like? Clear, perfect, no problem, everything good. This is before Adam and Eve, but this is what happened with you people and me people. This is what happened with us people. We sinned, and when we sin, what happens to us? All right, messed everything up. So this is us. This is the sin of the world, and this is you. Well, when a person believes in Jesus, this is Jesus, pure. When a person believes in Jesus Christ, Christ is poured into him, and he is turned pure. But not just them. Jesus atoned for the sin of the whole world. So when God the Father poured his sin into Christ, it was still pure. That's what happened. That's what happened on the cross in the empty tomb. Because it didn't end here. It ended here. Jesus is alive. He defeated death. He walked out of that tomb, and he's alive today, and he hasn't aged a day. Jesus is pure. He's perfect. He's holy, and he's good, and he's done this for you. So when you walk out today, walk out forgiven Walk out loved. I know what you deserve without even knowing you. I know what you deserve because I know what I deserve. But thanks be to God that he's given us not what we deserve, but what his son deserves. And he has made us pure in his sight. Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time. time. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, and awesome, and a gracious God. And we thank you for your beloved son, Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come. We thank you for his death. We thank you for his resurrection. We thank you for making us right with you through his blood. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen.